Amen. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning as we turn our hearts to God's word. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel 2, verse 1 through 11. 1 Samuel 2, verse 1 to 11. As we read together, uh, please turn in your Bibles. Um, and uh, as you do so, thank you, worship team, for that anointed time of worship. Uh, was really blessed uh, to follow along. Um, you know, I thank God for the emphasis on thanksgiving. Um, both during our time of worship as well as during the transition. Um, you know, as Bragwinga was reading, I was really blessed by uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, in everything, give thanks. And so this morning, our hearts well up with gratitude to God, and we thank him in all things. We give him praise, we give him worship, and we bless his holy name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you in 1 Samuel 2, verse 1 to 11? If you are, please follow along in your Bibles as we read together. It says from verse 1, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you, neither is there, excuse me, for there is none besides you, I'm used to the King James Version, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly, let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning we will be speaking um, from the topic titled Hannah's Prayer. Hannah's Prayer. Um, and today we are resuming our series, Prayers in the Bible, as we continue to exhort ourselves to be men and women who always pray and who don't faint in the place of prayer. By God's grace, so far in our series, we have studied the model prayer which Jesus taught to his disciples in Matthew chapter 6. And we've also studied Daniel's prayer, which Daniel prayed for the, or where, excuse me, Daniel prayed for the restoration of Israel in Daniel chapter 9. Today we come to Hannah's prayer, which we have read in our text today. But before we dive into a study of the contents of Hannah's prayer, 
Um, the preceding chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 1, gives us the context for Hannah's prayer. Hannah prayed this prayer when she came, in chapter 2, she prayed this prayer when she came to Shiloh to fulfill her vow, which she had made to the Lord, that if God would give her a male child, she would in return give him back to the Lord all the days of his life. So let's read some snippets of 1 Samuel chapter 1 together. We'll, read, we'll start from verse 1 through verse 11. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, in Shiloh, also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, when Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. Let's jump to verse 19. Then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. We jump to verse 24. It says, now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with, her, with three bulls, one epa of flour and a skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. We see the context of Hannah's second prayer. We see that Elkanah, Hannah's husband, had two wives, Hannah and Penina. While Hannah was barren, Penina had sons and daughters. Bible scholars tell us that in ancient Israel, infertility brought great or severe disgrace to a woman because it meant she couldn't fulfill her God-given purpose of producing offspring for her family. And they tell us that Elkanah probably married Penina because Hannah was barren. 
As if her inability to have children was not enough affliction, we read that Penina would taunt her. Every year when they went up to, to, for the yearly sacrifice, Penina would taunt her that she didn't have children, would mock her, and would cruelly add to her affliction. Well, one day while they were before the tabernacle of God in Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to the tabernacle and prayed. She prayed to God. She made a vow to God and said in her prayer, she said that she asked God to see her affliction. She asked God to not forget her. And she asked God to give her a male child. As she prayed, Hannah made a vow to God and said, and, if, and said that if God answered her, that she would give this child back to God all the days of his life and that no razor would come upon his head. God heard her prayer and gave Hannah a male child, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked him from the Lord. Bible scholars tell us that the name literally meant name of God. The name Samuel literally meant name of God, but it also sounded like heard by God. When Hannah gave Samuel this name, she was saying that God had heard her prayer. She was declaring that God had heard her prayer. That's the context for this second prayer. That's what has happened. God had given Hannah a child. God had answered her prayer. And now as we return back to our text in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, we see that Hannah was coming back or had come back to fulfill this vow that she had made to God. And in that process, or while she was there fulfilling the vow, she makes this second prayer. It's actually her second prayer in the book of 1 Samuel, her first prayer that was recorded or that we hear about, we're told about in 1 Samuel chapter 1, right, was to ask God for a child. And this, her second prayer, now she prays as she brings Samuel, her little child, and at that time, her only child, as she brings him back to God so that he could live in God's tabernacle as she had vowed. In contrast to her first prayer, which we are told was made in bitterness of soul, this second prayer was made in joy. It was made from a place of joy. And the main idea in her second prayer is that God is a righteous judge. And so as we go through the details of this, her second prayer, by God's grace, we will discuss four lessons about prayer from Hannah's prayer, which is in our text. And the first lesson that we will discuss together is that Hannah's prayer was a testimony of God's faith. Hannah's prayer was a testimony of God's faithfulness. Verse 1 of our text begins, and Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Hannah asked God for a child and God heard and answered her prayer. She was a beneficiary of God's mercy and she felt obligated to come back to thank God for his mercies. How often do we receive answers to our prayers but fail to be grateful? How often do we pray and God answers and we forget or ignore to come back to say thank you? I'm so glad uh, for the emphasis on, of thanksgiving that we've already had in our service today, both by the worship team and during our time of transition. And here again, God is reminding us of the need to be thankful. This wasn't in my notes, but we'll borrow it. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, in everything, the Bible says, we should what? Give thanks. In everything, we should give thanks. Hannah was not ungrateful. Hannah returned in prayer to give thanks to God. 
And the lesson for us is we must not forget to give God thanks. We must not forget to show God gratitude because thanksgiving is due to our God. We can also learn from Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving. Hannah declared in verse 1, which we read, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Notice what she rejoices in, or whom, excuse me, she rejoices in as she prays. She rejoices in the Lord. My heart rejoices in the Lord, Samuel, um, Hannah says, showing us, teaching us, telling us that when God answers our prayers, we are not merely to be thankful for the gift. We're not merely to be thankful for the answers to our prayers. That's good. That's important. But more than the answers to our prayers and being thankful for the answers to our prayers, we are to rejoice in God, the giver, above the gift. She rejoices in the Lord. She was no doubt thankful for Samuel, but she recognized God as the giver and rejoiced in the Lord. She reminds us of the story of the one leper in Luke chapter 17 who came back to Jesus after Jesus had healed him or Jesus had told him to go, told him and the nine other lepers to go and present themselves to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. And this one leper, the other nine took their healing and they were off. If they were grateful to Jesus, they didn't show it. But this one leper, he returns, demonstrating to us that he valued, he esteemed Jesus more than the gift he had received. How thankful are we to God in the place of prayer? We're talking of this first point that Hannah's prayer was a testimony of God's faithfulness. How often are we thankful to God in prayer? How often do we testify, come back to testify to God of what he has done? It may seem trivial. No doubt it's a message that we all know. But today we are being reminded that when we come to God in the place of prayer, our thanksgiving is important. Our thanksgiving is important. How often do we return to give thanks to God for the things he does? Luke 17, verse 15 to 19, the story we just referred to, it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not found, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Hannah continued in verse one. Let's continue her prayer saying that her horn was exalted in the Lord. She says, I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Excuse me, no, Hannah continued in verse 1 saying, I smiled at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. In the Bible, the horn was a symbol of strength and power because the horn through the horn, a, a, a ram or an ox could demonstrate or display its power, could display its strength. When Hannah prayed, declaring that her horn was exalted in the Lord, she was saying her strength and power were exalted in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. She rejoiced in God's salvation and vindication from the provocation of Penina. As she declared God's faithfulness to save her from affliction. This theme or this idea that Hannah's prayer was a testimony to God's faithfulness, we see continued later in verse 8 and verse 9, Hannah would affirm in these verses God's faithful care for his saints. These verses say, verse 8 and 9 say, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. 
For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength, no man shall prevail. Hannah's prayer was a testimony of God's faithfulness. And as we pray, may God help us not to deny God of the thanks that is due to his name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Our second point today, as we continue in verse 2, is that Hannah's prayer was a song of praise. First point, Hannah's prayer was a testimony of God's faithfulness. And now we see that her prayer was also a song of praise. Many Bible scholars tell us that Hannah's prayer was a song. It was written in poetic form and was likely sung as a form of oral history. As she continues in verse 2, she begins to praise God for his character and his nature. She says in verse 2, no one is holy like the Lord. Amen. No one is holy like the Lord. Like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Bible scholars tell us that her prayer was in poetic form, it was a song. She declares in verse 2 God's holiness, which means that God is set apart, He's unique, like no other, totally like no other. But having said that, in the first phrase of verse 2, having said, No one is holy like the Lord. What does she say next? She says, for there is none besides you. She essentially says the same thing, but in different words. For there is none besides you, she says. And in verse, and then she ends verse two with saying, nor is there any rock like our God. Again, she's saying the same thing using different words. And Bible scholars tell us that Hannah was employing a form of Hebrew poetry, a classic form of Hebrew poetry known as synonymous parallelism. She was praising God in poetic form, she was, but, but she would repeat herself. She would say essentially the same thing in different words. She was praising God in poetic form. Her prayer was a song of praise. And in this point, we want to emphasize that our times of prayer can include songs of praise to God, praise and worship to him as we declare his character and his nature. As we worship God, even on our knees in prayer, as we praise God, we, we, we play worship music to, 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 to express and worship and declare his praise. Again, it may seem obvious, but that's a lesson that's instructive in our text today. The Psalms are songs, the Psalms in the Bible are songs or hymns, some of which have been set to music in our day. Let's read some psalms today that are prayers, but we also know our hymns or songs because they're psalms. Psalm 37 verse 1 to 7 says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noon day. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Psalm 103, verse 1 to 3, 1 to 2, excuse me, which is a popular song today. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. The psalmist says, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, 
Oh, my soul, as we pray, we're blessing God, we're worshiping him, and we are praising him. Amen. In Psalm, in Acts chapter 16, excuse me, verse 25 to 26, we read of Paul and Silas when they were thrown into prison who were praying and singing praises to God. It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Here we see Paul and Silas praying but also singing hymns to God as they prayed. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, we're talking, we're still on the point this morning that Hannah's prayer was a song of praise as we see that our prayers can and should include times of praising, of singing, of hymns, of worshiping God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, Paul speaking here about um, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit he says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. Our times of prayer should include times of praise and worship to God where we sing to him, declaring his character, calling him by his names, declaring his nature and his character. See, when we focus on what God has done, when we pray about what God has done, that is thanksgiving. That's our first point today. That's thanksgiving. But when we pray and worship and declare God and declare the nature and the character of God, that is praise. That is adoration. That is worshiping God, focusing on who he is. Returning to Hannah's prayer in verse 2, she declares that there is no rock like our God. She concludes verse 2 by saying that there is no rock like our God. This was a metaphor for God that emphasized his strength or the, his strength and the security of those who put their trust in God. Our prayers, our times of prayers should include songs of praise. Hannah's prayer was a song of praise as she declared God's holiness, as she declared God's uniqueness, as she declared that there was no rock like him. Amen. Amen. Let's move on to our third point today. Hannah's prayer Third lesson about prayer that we see from this prayer that Hannah prayed as she came to fulfill her vow before God. Hannah's prayer was a declaration of God's sovereignty. Hannah's prayer was a declaration of God's sovereignty. In verse three of our text, Hannah's prayer continues or continued with a warning for the proud. She said, talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge. And by him, actions are weighed. The reason we are not to be proud here is because God is the God of knowledge. Who weighs our actions. And next to God... We know nothing, so we should be humble. We read it in verse 9 as well. It says, for by strength, no one will prevail. And we see here Hannah's instruction or warning more accurately for the proud. In the place of prayer, and at all times, we should be humble. We come humbling ourselves, understanding that God is sovereign. From verse 4 to verse 7, her prayer speaks about how things can change when God intervenes. She's acknowledging again the sovereignty of God over life circumstances. Things can change in a moment. Things can change when our God intervenes. In verse 4, she says, The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. See the contrast. 
Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Again, contrasting. Life circumstances can change when God intervenes. Even the barren has born seven and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. It is the Lord. He can kill, but he can also make alive. He can, he can bring down to the grave, but he can also bring up. The Lord, verse 7, makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. In these verses, we see Hannah contrasting several things. She contrasts the mighty and the weak in verse 4. She contrasts in verse 5, the fool and the hungry. But she also contrasts in verse 5, the barren and the fertile. She contrasts in verse 6, the dead and the alive. She contrasts in verse 7, the poor and the rich. And again in verse 7, the humble and the exalted. We are being reminded, even as Hannah makes this contrast of God's sovereignty, we're being reminded that in all things, God is sovereign and in, he will do as he sees fit. He will do as he sees fit. And even in difficult situations, like the situation that Hannah went through, the time of suffering, the time of affliction, the time of cruelty, from Penina, her adversary, God remains sovereign. And so we can trust him in every situation. When we talk of suffering, we remember in the Bible, perhaps the first person that comes to mind is who? Job. And Job 42, verse 1 to 2, Job answered the Lord after God had responded to him and, and, and corrected him, Job answered to answer the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. What is Job saying? He's saying God is sovereign. He's saying that God can do anything. He can do everything. He does as he sees fit. In Romans 8 verse 28, we read, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. In Hannah's story, which we read in verse 1, we Notice that we read that God shot her womb twice. We read that, that God shot her womb. Between the time she prayed her first prayer and her second prayer, between, Bible scholars tell us, between two and five years would have passed based on the winning period for children at that time in ancient Israel. So between her first and second prayers, anywhere from two to five years, would have passed. In that time, Hannah would have had time to reflect on all that had happened to her. And we see her second prayer is rich in wisdom, showing someone who had come to know God better through her experiences. Her prayer reflects that she had grown from someone who just viewed God as the solution, who viewed God, excuse me, just as the solution to her problems, to someone who had a greater knowledge and understanding of God's nature and character. She knew that she was barren because the Lord had closed her womb. And she knew that her prayer had been answered. The reason her womb had been opened was because God had intervened. God was the one who had intervened. And through it all, Hannah could see the hand of God. She could see the hand of God in it all, moving her from where she was when she was barren, her time of suffering, and bringing her out of that suffering and out of that affliction. And so when our circumstances, brothers and sisters, seem overwhelming, when we don't feel like coming to God in prayer, or we've prayed and prayed, think about it. The Bible tells us only about two times that Hannah prayed. But I'm sure that Hannah cried to God more than, those, more than that one time that's recorded for us. She kept praying. She could see the hand of God, excuse me, she kept praying. And so for us, the lesson is we should not despair because our sovereign God can intervene 
in all circumstances. She understood the sovereignty of God at work. And if we think about it, think about God's purpose in giving Hannah Samuel and the role that Samuel would play and see how God was sovereignly at work such that Samuel came at just the right time so that he could take over, if you would, from Eli or from Eli's lineage and fulfill God's purposes for Israel. So when things are going well, remember, let's remember God is sovereign. The warning that Anna gives us here teaches us both sides. When things are going well, we should be humble, knowing that God is sovereign. Yes, we should. When things aren't going well, we should look to God in our suffering. We should look to him in our challenges. We should come to him and come to him with our prayers and, and bring our prayers before him. But when things are going well as well, see Hannah's humility, she comes before God, she acknowledges him. We should not be proud because we know that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Hannah's prayer was a declaration of God's sovereignty. That's our third point today. Our final, fourth and final point today is Hannah's prayer was prophetic. Hannah's prayer was prophetic. Let's read from verse 10 of our text. And as we read from this verse, you'll see that Hannah's prayer, which we've talked about, includes thanksgiving, includes praise and worship to God, includes a warning for the proud and a declaration of God's sovereignty, instructs us that God is sovereign. In all things, through our suffering and through the joyful times, God is sovereign. But now her prayer turns to prophecy. Verse 10 says, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven, he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Excuse me. Hannah first declares that God's adversaries will be broken into pieces. And then she says that God would judge the ends of the earth. She was saying here that God would impose his righteous rule on the earth. She continued by saying in verse 10, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. At the time she prayed this prayer, she's praying here that God would give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. But at the time she prays this prayer, she prayed this prayer, even Israel didn't have a king. Israel didn't have an earthly king, yet she prayed that God would give strength to his king and that God would exalt the horn of his anointed. Bible scholars tell us that when Hannah prayed this, she was looking forward to a time when a king would rule the nation of Israel. But her use of the term anointed was a clear messianic prophecy. The term she used for anointed here is Messiah in the Hebrew. It's the word Christ in the Greek, the word anointed in English. We see that as Hannah prayed, God revealed to her what was to come. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, she received and declared this prophetic revelation. Reminds us of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, where he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. We can learn from this that we are to depend on the Holy Spirit in the place of prayer. 
We should depend on the Holy Spirit in the place of prayer. When we pray, we should acknowledge and welcome the Holy Spirit, asking and trusting him to help us pray according to the will of God. Hannah's prophecy in her prayer was fulfilled in part in the reign of King David, but it is fulfilled in the ultimate anointed one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We see here the role of the Holy Spirit in prayer. Again, verse 9 tells us, by strength, no man can prevail. If we want to be men and women who will grow in the place of prayer, if we want to be men and women who will always pray and not faint, if we want to be men and women who deepen our prayer lives and our relationship with God, we must rely on the Holy Spirit. We must acknowledge him. We must depend on him. And we must look to him. We must look to him. We're talking about our final point. Hannah's prayer was prophetic. It was prophetic. Bible scholars also point out on this point that the Magnificat, which is Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, strongly echoes Hannah's song in this, her second prayer. Let's read Luke chapter 1. We'll see similarities between Hannah's prayer and Mary's prayer. Luke 1 verse 46 to 55 says, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. Did you notice that? Who is the rejoicing in? It's in God, my savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And we see similarities. Hannah talks about God raising her up about God intervening. And here Mary talks about God regarding her lonely state and that henceforth all generations will call her blessed. Verse 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. There is none holy as the Lord, Hannah prays. Here Mary declares and holy is his name and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Do you see the parallels between Hannah's prayer and the prayer that the song that Mary or the prayer or song that Mary prayed in Luke chapter 1? In verse 54, Mary says he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy and he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Just like Hannah's song foreshadowed Samuel's role as prophet, priest, and judge in Israel, Mary's song would usher in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our ultimate prophet, priest, and king. Hannah's prayer was prophetic. Let's conclude in verse 11, the final verse of our text. Today we read, then Elkanah, went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. At the end of her prayer, Elkanah and his family returned to Ramah, while Samuel ministered to the Lord in Shiloh. As we close today, we've seen several lessons about prayer. Several aspects of prayer from Hannah's prayer. First, our first point, we said Hannah's prayer was a testimony declaring God's, excuse me, testifying to God's faithfulness. Her prayer testified to God's faithfulness. And we too should remember to thank God when he answers our prayers. Hannah's prayer was a song of praise and our times of pr prayers can and should include songs to God as we praise him for his nature and his character. Hannah's prayer was a declaration of God's sovereignty, reminding us that God is in control of our lives and that things can change when God 
intervenes. Finally, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Hannah's prayer was prophetic, reminding us to depend on the Holy Spirit as we pray. May God help us to grow in our prayer lives and may we be men and women who always pray and who don't faint in the place of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. This morning, would you just bow your head wherever you are as we respond to God's word. This year, God is taking us through a study on prayer, our theme for the year, new beginnings through the power of prayer. New beginnings through the power of prayer. Let's respond to God's word today as we ask God, Lord, help me to grow in the place of prayer. Help me to grow in the place of prayer. We've seen several aspects of prayer from Hannah's prayer, her second prayer that we studied today. We've seen the role of thanksgiving, testifying to God, testifying in our prayers, remembering and declaring what God has done, rejoicing in God, rejoicing in him more than in the gift, acknowledging him as the giver. We've seen the role of praise, worship in prayer, and how as we worship God in prayer, excuse me, we declare his nature. We've seen that Hannah declared God's sovereignty, understanding that he was and is in control in everything, in the things that we, we, we consider good, in the things we consider bad. God is sovereign and we can trust him and we can look to him. We can come to him. We can come to him in our despair, we can come to him in our bitterness. And even when we are joyful and when he answers us, we should remember, she gives us a warning not to be proud. We've seen the prophetic role through the power of the Holy Spirit manifested in Hannah's prayer. Let's just respond to God today and say, Lord, help me to grow in prayer. Help me to grow in prayer. Help me to grow in thanksgiving. Help me to grow in praise. Help me to grow in my trust for the, of you in every situation and circumstance. And help me, Lord, to grow even in my dependence on the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word today. We thank you so much for your word. Can we just close this morning with a time of, let's just sing that song together, worship team. If you can help us today. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Can you help us worship him? Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Let's all rise to our feet together this morning. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship is Lord. The Lord, oh my soul, come on, worship wherever you are in the auditorium in your home. Let's just praise and worship this God who is sovereign over all. We worship your holy name. Oh my soul. Worship is all. Come on, one more time together. Let's just sing that song together. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Oh my soul. his holy name. Sing like never before.
Heavenly Father, we worship your holy name this morning. We thank you for your word today. Thank you that you are the sovereign God who is in control of our lives, every situation and every circumstance that we may find ourselves in, whether, Lord, they are negative or whether they are pleasant. And Lord, you're the sovereign God who deserves our thanksgiving you're the sovereign God who deserves our praise and worship. And so today we give it to you. Even as we depend on you and trust you, trust in your Holy Spirit to continue to help us to grow in the place of prayer. Help us, Lord. Help us individually and as a church congregation as we continue to study this topic of prayer this year. That we would grow in the place of prayer. That we would be deepened. Our prayer lives would be deepened, O oh God. And Lord, that your name and your name alone would be glorified. And so we thank you this morning. We praise you and we worship you. Blessed be your name, O God. Go with us into the week ahead and prosper us, O God, in all our ways. We love you and we thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name, O God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace together in fellowship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a blessed week ahead in Jesus' name. Amen.